Welcome to Revelation 16 and the Seven Vials of God's Wrath, a podcast brought to you by End Generation Project. Join Michael as he delves into this pivotal chapter, uncovering key insights and navigating through spiritual complexities. Discover the importance of standing firm against worldly influences and embracing biblical truths. Don't miss out on this profound message. Navigate through internal emotions and spiritual influences with expert advice from well-renowned speaker, Mike from COT. We delve into this rebroadcast of Revelation 16 and the seven vials of God's wrath and the significance of our ongoing spiritual growth, especially now more than ever. Don't miss out on this powerful message. For more Council of Time content, be sure to visit and show your support for Michael and the Council of Time at their only official website, linked in the description below. Now let's get into today's Council of Time episode number 33, Revelation 16 and the Seven Vials of God's Wrath on End Generation Project. Good evening, everybody out there. Hopefully the volume's okay. I hope it is. Good to see everybody. I know it's early. It's only 6.30. But I've been up all night. I really have. I can honestly tell you that I do never want to move a database again. You think you're done, and of course you have more, more things to do, always more things to do. Well, here we are. It's good to see you guys. Some people are not going to be happy, so make sure, you guys, please make sure your recorders are going. Let me see something here. In fact, I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to do it here. I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, every time I do this on this one, it seems like it's not worth it. <laughs> That's what it seems like every time I record here. It seems like it's not worth recording. How's volume, everybody? I can already tell you that uh, before 7 p.m., we'll probably take a break. We probably will. I did not charge this headset. Uh, so I'm going to be doing that throughout this broadcast. Hopefully, it can last the entire time. We're going to finish up on the seven bulls of God's wrath. And as you can see so far, uh, it's not good. Not good for those who are left behind. Not good at all. Also, we're going to clear up. Oh, I'm going to show you guys something because many people are under the impression that Revelation is is actually, Revelation is actually not in an order. I can see why people would say that, right? But it's very good we don't speculate. It's, it's important that we don't speculate. When we don't speculate, something else takes place, right? I can see the points where somebody would see, and they say, well, that's, you know, out of order. And one of those points of uh, one of those points of overlaps would be the Euphrates River, correct? I wish I had somebody here who who has a who understands it that way, right? Who thinks or who perceives that Revelation is not in order? Here's why: when you have somebody who thinks Revelation is not in order, I'm interested to see why. Very interested to see why. Not to argue, right? None of that, but to learn. I love to learn. I do. I love to learn. And I certainly do not want to hold. Um, I don't really have a theory, right? I don't do that. I tend to, the word is God's word. It's not my word. It's God's word. And so I tend to leave it be. But I'm very interested to see. Uh, why people think that's out of order, right? It's a good way to clarify things, actually. It is. So if any of you guys are out there who think, you, you really do believe, Revelation is out of order, let me know. Please don't fail to speak up. Remember something. I may be talking, but we're all learning, right? Uh, part of refinement, part of being refined, is to actually increase your knowledge, right? Refine your knowledge. To be able 
uh, uh, to see what the Lord is doing. And every single year, right, we're going to see more and more. Of course, things have been escalated big time. They have. So, hey, without further ado, let's begin, shall we? You guys ready? Oh, I forgot to pull something up. I'm sorry. Let me pull this up before I uh, get started here. Tomorrow is, somebody pointed that out. Tomorrow is one of the dates on the uh, KD Files page. It is. Now, does that date, I, I don't want you guys to think of those dates as, you know, I better pack my bags or something like that. Please don't do that. Don't do that. Um, those dates are there for a reason, obviously, right? But don't act on them. Don't act on them unless you're, you know, given some express instructions from the Most High. Don't act on them. Don't be afraid of them. Just observe. So you have to do is observe. I can almost, without a doubt, tell you that the Lord, He does use me in certain ways. Because of what must come forward, there has to be some credibility established uh, so that some of, the, some of the more unbelievable things can be tolerated uh, by those who really can't tolerate unbelievable things. And if somebody has some credibility, well then, um, they're going to listen a little bit, maybe just enough to have some insight, okay? Now, it is known that the, the, that you guys remember that big solar flare, right? I believe it was on the 20, oh, no, I'm sorry, not 20th, on the um, 18th, uh, somewhere around there, 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th. It was a, uh, one of the biggest ones that we've had. That same spot is pointed towards Earth. You guys know that, that same spot. What would happen if it let off a solar flare? It would hit us 100%. And it would not be some passive event, and we would have about eight minutes to get ready. That's what would happen. So isn't it a blessing to know that it has not happened yet? Because I'll say it again, one of the, most, uh, one of the biggest spots that released that giant solar flare, right, is pointed directly towards us. Directly towards us, directly towards Earth. Hmm? directly towards us. Somebody says, uh, Mike, can you comment on artifacts? Steve Quayle is finding these artifacts pretty... No, I can't. I can't. But why would that be disturbing? We have time, but why would that be disturbing if something predates Adam? Anybody? Why? Anybody? Would that be... Why would that be disturbing? Will that kind of lose your foundations of faith? Let's go ahead and face it. We don't know everything, right? And who wrote the book? Who wrote the Torah? Who wrote the Torah? Who gave us that book? Why do we have that book? That was given to who? Moses. Correct? And you can read that and see that Moses had a, almost like a summary of what we need to have, right? A summary. Right? If you read the New Testament, you're going to find out that a lot of what God reveals, he does so spiritually. He did not have it written down. Isn't that something? Right? That used to be a controversy for those who would read the New Testament. It certainly was for the Pharisees. Right? It was. Let me ask you guys something. Did In the Old Testament, in the Torah, did it say anything about, anything about, um, Jesus, right, and Judas, did it? Did it say anything about Jesus sending disciples out two by two? Did it? Did it say anything about Jesus being the vessel of both God's word and his spirit in the earth? That his word would be so declarative that whatever he spoke was. Did it say anything about Jesus walking on the water? No, it didn't. So some things are revealed 
right? Yeah. And then we document them. Before Adam and Eve, the earth was. We can look at Genesis and see that before Adam and Eve, things were created. We don't know how long that took. And, and, and it, it, the Bible, it says God did that the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, right? And he rested on the seventh day. In the Bible it says, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. That means one equals one thousand. One thousand equals one. That's the negation. That ends up being one. That means there's no time to the living God. That means that each second that goes by, God can have that be a thousand years or two or three or four thousand years to him. If he knows the count of the hairs on your head, think about this. He knows the count on the hairs on your head, right? The count, the very count. He knows that count. How in the world can somebody know the count of the hairs on your head? If, if the count of the hairs on your head are changing all the time. That would mean, through for observation, God can slow you down and inspect every particle of you over and over again for a thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years, and all of that will only be one second of your life. He can also take your entire life and see it all the way through, and all that would be a fraction of a second for the most time. Think about that. So if time means nothing to the Creator, right, and He knows the count of the hairs on your head, and the count of the hairs on your head are constantly changing, right? That means he can inspect all of us billions of times per second. Every single soul on earth, every single person who has passed, every single person who will come, every single particle in creation, he can inspect that a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, twenty thousand, two hundred thousand times over and over again before one second passes. Nothing in your life, if the wind blows on your face, it is not out of control. God knows every molecule in that air. God knows the composition of the air. God knows all the toxins in the air. Everything. So that means nothing is out of control. And time is meant for us, not for the Creator. Hmm? That's why no one, none of you should ever be afraid. Not one. Not one. Now, doesn't that kind of take the anxiety out of everything? If the sun blew up right now, I'm going to tell you something. If it's not your time to go, there's nothing that exists that can make you go anywhere. Do you know that? If it's not your time, you're not going anywhere. It doesn't matter what comes. It doesn't matter if the earth blows up. If it's not your time, you're not going anywhere. You're not. Simple as that. When it is your time, you're going to be gone. Take note of something that God has arranged your life. This is not your paradise. This is only but for a moment in time. This whole life you're living is but a daydream. You fell asleep, had a dream called life, right? One day you're going to wake up. You're going to wake up in eternity, but you will have made a decision in this dream called reality. And in that dream, you're, all this stuff is coming at you. But you're saying, I'm going to serve the Lord anyway. I choose the Lord. I can identify with the Lord. I love the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that you're doing all that. 
And when you wake up from that dream, you will be family. Family. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. Who is that? Um, uh, fix it. Mr. Fix it. Go ahead. Re-email that. The reason why is because we have a pop server right now that is... Uh, Guys, that was a lot of emails, uh, and I have to write, uh, do another sorting script to get everything separated again, because there are so many emails in there. There's no way anybody could ever go in there and read them. We're talking about your emails, everybody else's emails, uh, emails from the other sources, emails from junk email, all sorts of email is in there. And so I have to write a script to separate everything, right? which is why it's important in your, your accounts that you make sure that your email address, above all things, is correct. Please make sure that's correct because it will utilize that data and bounce it against your identity to prioritize your mail unless it finds a distressing conversation in there. Right? The computer can read your emails, all the emails, you know, quick. You can do that quick. In about a minute, it can read everybody's. I know what you're talking about, but I can't. And so it has to categorize that based on, you know, certain priorities that we set. That's how that works. Ah, pretty advanced for an email system, huh? What do you say? It's, it's quite, uh, it, it worked. I'll put it that way. It worked. The code worked, right? I can't help it. I don't use anything here that's really industry standard. I can't do it because I know that one day uh, they're going to draw back on us. They're going to draw back on every group and every organization that is not loyal to them. And when they do that, people are going to be out. They're going to be hung out to dry. Everybody who did a website, for example, with WordPress or something like that, some third-party tool, what's going to happen is when the when when you, this year, I believe it, yeah, it's coming out this year, when the some of those mandates come out, right? You will not be able, it won't allow your website to even show if you have certain things on there, right? You will not be able to say Jesus is the only way to be saved, just in case you don't know. Right? You guys, if you didn't like me last night, you're really not going to like me tonight. I want you guys to know this before I open my big mouth, okay? I am no friend of evil works. I'm not. Despite what anybody may say or believe, I am no friend of evil works. And the Lord has given me insight into evil works that they don't really work against me, right? The only thing that has ever worked against me is when evil works through other people to get to me. If I'm ever put in that position, as far as me personally, nothing can get to me, right? As far as this organization... Well, if Satan gets to you, naturally, it's not going to be looking good. But nothing can get to me, and I will not pardon, uh, be evil. Now, some of you also believe that somehow I may be biased concerning political candidates. Never think that because I am not. In fact, I do not like these systems in the earth. So somebody asked me one day, they said, well, I thought you were patriotic. You were wounded multiple times for your country. I said, correction, I was wounded multiple times for the people of the country. Because there is no country without the people. See, people can dance around little words and try and refit words and, 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 and sneak this one in and take that one out. They can do that all day. I will fight for people. Yes. I'm not going to fight for dirt. Not doing that. This place would would be nothing without you. Right? Anybody ever, you know, on the holidays, some of you may not have gone through this, but on the holidays, you get a lot of people who get together. And if you're by yourself or something like that, just imagine a lot of people getting together. Your house is full of life. And when they leave, it's dead again. Right? I'm sure that plenty of people know exactly what I'm talking about. It's dead without people. It becomes lifeless, useless. In fact, you make it a little sad because it seems like the life level went down a bit when they're not there, right? All these lands are the same way. Without you, these lands 
or wastelands. What Satan is interested in doing is trying to convince people that these lands are perfect without you. How dumb is that? That's just dumb in my book. It's very dumb. And because people want to believe that, they're going to get a taste of what barren means in every land. Now, I have no favorites concerning politics, so let me give you guys an outlook. The more people bring Christianity into political topics, the more divisive it's becoming. It's becoming very divisive. People are actually starting to pick up on this. And they're actually starting to write policies to keep Christianity further away from all politics. They're starting to hate statements of faith. Because people who do not maintain their faith are making these statements. Right? And all of a sudden now, see, here's the deal. If a person does not talk about Christ, but once, he, once every four years, something is wrong, wouldn't you say? If a person loves the Lord, wouldn't that be a daily come? I mean, nothing they would do would be absent Christ, right? But they're using Christ. And I don't fall for that. In fact, that's extremely disheartening. I just don't fall for the thing because my hope is in Christ. My hope is certainly not in people. The Lord's going to do what the Lord's going to do. I don't have a fear of who's going to be president and what they're going to do. They can't do anything unless the Lord permits it. And if the Lord permits it, he did so on purpose, regardless of the people. But all I see are people utilizing the name of Jesus, the name above every name. To get close to people and what they believe. Once they take up their positions, they will discard it again. You'll not hear it again. It's not priority. In a Christian's life, Christ is priority regardless of where they are. Christ. Is priority. Now again, as a consequence of this utilizing the name of Jesus for personal gain, for personal things, it's causing an opposition to Christ to rise. It will be one of the biggest reasons. Have you noticed that the, um, or for example, the shooting at Joel Olstein's church, right? The shooting at the six other churches. They didn't mention those. I guess Joel Olstein's church was big enough. All of them are. It's terrible, right? It is. It's terrible. So you have these shootings at churches that literally are taking place every single month. Every month. Every single month, mass shootings at churches. Now, I didn't hear anybody mentioned that, you know, the viewpoint of Christianity concerning these people shooting. In other words, I heard people start talking about guns and start talking about how people should have guns and others talk about how certain people shouldn't have guns. They turn it into a political debate. That, by the way, is draconian speech. That's what that is, draconian speech. At any rate, you don't hear about Christ, Jesus. You don't hear about that. It's not what you're hearing. What you are hearing are people who are making policies, right, to fully separate the influence of Christianity from everything. You're also going to begin to hear Christianity be villainized. So let me run you through a scenario. Let's say President Trump wins. People are going to, some people are going to be happy, and but they're also going to be very vindictive. They're going to say, I told you so. Some are going to spit in the faces of others. 
they will. They're going to spit right in the faces. Face, they're going to spit in the faces of the Democrats. They will. And then, of course, all their ideas, they will attempt to, to pass, right? The Republicans will. They're going to recognize Jerusalem again. And when they recognize Jerusalem, they will ignite the world. And this world will be set on fire. It sounds like a good sentiment, doesn't it? I recognize Jerusalem, mind you. I'm sure that everybody who's read the Bible does. I'm sure they do. When you do that to the world, you're going to incite violence with those who do not believe in the narrative of Israel. In an act of defiance, in an act of opposition. A league of nations will join and burn everything that blessed Israel. That's what they're going to do. Now, whether they fully succeed or not, we're reading about that in Revelation. So don't deceive yourselves saying nothing will happen to Jerusalem. That's not what the Word of God says. What will happen in the USA? You may not know this, but there's been a number slide. Have you guys noticed they were they were depressing the census badly? Have you guys noticed? Are you harassed by the census? Aren't you getting communications, phone calls, text messages, all sorts of communications explaining to you that you have to be part of the census? You will if you have not. You will. Because they need to know what they're up against. They already know that a great percentage of America is full of foreigners. In fact, all of America is full of foreigners. Hope you know that. All of us are foreigners. From many different backgrounds. Right? America is, in fact, the great melting pot. But there are a lot of people here in America that do not share American ideologies nor the values of America. They are here to escape where they were, to capitalize, to make them money, to send back home to their people. They use America to enrich their families. They use the systems of America to enrich their families. They do not stand with the vision of America. They stand against it. They are loyal to their own homelands. And they're right here in this nation, legally. Legally. And when Jerusalem is declared this time because of what happened with Hamas, because of what happened in Gaza, because of what happened in Lebanon, because of what happened in Yemen, and all these different things that are happening, They're going to rise up to fight for their homeland just as hard as you would fight for yours. They're going to fight for their people. Why? Because somebody made a spiritual declaration, a faith declaration. When you make a faith declaration, you instantly force everybody's mindset back to the root of their faith. And at the root of the faith of many who live in the USA, they are not loyal to Christ Jesus. So you will see an uprising, an act of violence on a brand new scale. This will introduce a type of lockdown. This will change how we live life from that point forward. And at that point, the world will break out even more in what they're doing. There was recently an act that took place about a few months ago. I told you guys about it. I told you to watch for it. Part of the ceremony. 
When somebody does a very specific thing, they do so to complete the ceremony of the unleashing of demons. When these demons are unleashed, violence increases in all lands. And before you think it's a joke, it's been that way every single time. It happened every single time. Somebody would do this unthinkable act, and violence would break out all over the place. No land is spared when this happens. But this time, this time, it came through a bloodline. I can assure you it was not some ordinary person who completed this act. No. I can also assure you it makes no sense for this act to have taken place by the one who did it. Nevertheless, it happened. That should be a big signal to all of you. That means a rising is at hand. Direct opposition to you and to your faith. So here we go, and all is on schedule, and people are responding nicely, they say. I cannot qualify that word they, just have to leave it there. Anyway, that's what happens. And people are, it's very difficult to see in this time. As for me, I'll give no one glory except the Lord. As for me, I lift up the Lord, and the Lord will lift up those who obey him, but I will lift him up. I will help my brothers and sisters without hesitation, but I will only lift up the name of the Lord, no one else. I hope all of us can reevaluate who the Lord is in our lives and make sure that he is in fact King of Kings and Lord of Lords in our lives. Because if we don't, there will come a great loss. Also, when this happens, many Christians are going to have to wake up the alarm clock will go off. And at that point, the world, they will seek to strike each other. They will. I hope you guys are ready for that. Because if it goes in a certain direction, that's precisely what will take place. Don't ask me why I'm so confident about that, why I'm saying that. Well, we're going to find out, won't we? We will find out. We'll find out. See, because the Lord warned us about this time. This to me, folks. Men would call evil good and good evil. He told us, it's not up to us to judge. It's up to us to refine our lives and to make sure, to make sure, to make sure that our Lord is Joshua HaMashiach. Not Biden. Not Trump. Not the guy with the ears. But I hope you're ready. Hope you're ready. I know people are not going to like me for those statements, but uh, I'm sorry. Uh, to be true to what the Lord has given me. And it's up to us to be true to what the Lord has given to all of us. Be true to what the Lord has given you, no matter what it is. If the Lord gave it to you, be true with it. Be true. Because when you are true with it, you will see the results of what the Lord gave you. 
You'll see. Somebody says, are the KD files up and running? We just transferred the database. As you guys know, a small update. Our server blew up. You guys remember that? It just totally smoked, right? Thanks to you guys, we have the the uh, four processors running inside the server. Right? It's, it's not the full load, but I thank God for it. I certainly couldn't afford it. So it's up and running, right? We did some tuning and tweaking. Because, of course, the server, they can take a lot of memory and a lot of processors to do what they have to do. And since everything, all that, uh, the new pieces went in there, and certain uh, checksum systems went in there, too, we had to reload the system, right? Move all the SATA drives, clusters, uh, get all those back in there, make sure they were working, and then transfer the data. Because when the system smoked, we don't know the full integrity of those hard drives. We don't know. Those hard drives are not expensive. They're not. And they come in clusters. So, for for example, your computer uses one hard drive. Ours uses 12 for every one hard drive. They're hot swaps. In case a drive fails, you can easily pop one out throw another one in there. Right? Now, we had to swap in a way that we kept services going. So, that was very difficult. We still have other folks. We have, uh, uh, well, last night we had 394 people utilizing chat rooms. we got to be careful of what we're doing or everybody goes down. It's going to take a while to get them back up again. And we don't want to strain our bandwidth. Okay? COT is on a budget. Of course, naturally, we should be. Right? We don't carry as many ISPs as we used to. But for some reason, the billing is the same. Anyway. We're just being careful of what we're doing, so we just transferred that data last night. I started the day before yesterday. I was supposed to be done yesterday. I thought I was done. Wrong. I was not. And so I stayed up all night to transfer the rest of the data. Now that that database and the data tables and scripts and all that stuff is transferred, I'm going to reassimilate that data, integrate it back into the web page, and start launching the software for editing of KD files, loading up the library, so on and so forth. And it's a good time to go ahead and release articles. It is. But I want you guys involved. I can't be the only writer here. I can't do that. I want you guys involved. But I want you I want you guys collectively involved. So it's no competition. That means one person is not going to write something and then somebody else gets jealous because theirs weren't posted. No. We're going to set up teams of things so that we can give material by way of counsel to anybody who wants to read it. And I have this, this insight. As this table, when this table is ready, they're coming. They're coming. They will come when the table is ready. That means once everything is out there, a lot of people are going to start looking into it, and we cannot go backward from there. What I mean by going backward is we can't fold up from there. When people start coming to the website, a lot of people start coming to the website for these additional services and all these different reads. We have to maintain the integrity of the website. Now, on the human side of me, which is the earthbound side of me, that's a frightening ordeal because I can't support solely. I solely cannot support the whole operation. That makes me nervous. I don't like to do anything if my wallet cannot pay for it. You guys can understand that, right? Because I don't want the word of God hinged to anybody's giving. I know. So that if everybody gets mad at me, I can still tell the truth. That's why. Does that make sense? Like if I say something the Lord gives me and nobody likes it, and one person shows up the next day, well, no big deal. I'm going to still go forward with the word of God with that one person. But I don't want anything to compromise the word of God. So the human side of me is very nervous about launching these things only for Satan to plant a seed in somebody's mind. It's spread around and nobody gives. I've noticed in COT that based on what I'm talking about, it can cut off the faucet big time. It can. 
I do thank God for all of you who are consistent. You have no idea how much of a lifeline you are. You know, COT does not save money. We don't have money to save. So we take what we have and we utilize. That's how it's been working this whole time. And normally I give 11000 a month for COT operations, right? And then whatever everybody else did would compensate for the rest. And it would help with the rest, so that was good. That does not exist anymore. So it's very different now, right? And it is. It's pressure, as with all things. But Jimmy cracked corn about pressure. So long as you're doing something for Christ, being a work is true. Right? So long as you're doing it out of love, so long as money is only a tool, it's good. I just want to share that with you guys so you understand what the position is. And we do not get a lot of donations. We don't. Naturally, we don't. Not, not like you would think. You guys can name a figure what you think we get. I have no problem telling you guys exactly what we have and what we get. No problem. That's why we have a financial page. And it's about to fill up with all of our business. I see no problem with that either. Kind of like that. It means Satan can no longer lie. There have been times when people thought we were making a million dollars a month for some odd reason. Because of YouTube. Until people started finding out those YouTubes belong to other people, not COT. So naturally, right, you can imagine what that cut off, right? Because nobody wants to be used, and there are scams all over the place, aren't there? I don't blame people. I don't. Just keep that. Keep that. Uh, understand that. You know what that means? That means... In your own personal lives, don't sit there and say, well, when I get everything I need, I'm going to go do so-and-so for the Lord. Don't do that. Don't do it. That's not doing anything by faith. It's not. I don't know. Somebody says 1500 a month. Sometimes, so. one, well, sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes not. We have some, we have about, now we have about six people who give. And they're really good at giving. And last time when the service blew up, right, three people gave a chunk of change. And all of it went towards the service. And I'm very thankful for that. Very thankful. Without them, we would not have had a server. We wouldn't. We would have been barely making it, and other people would have been cut off the chat room. So the Lord impressed upon. And two of those people gave an exact amount of, I mean, a precise amount. Nope, that happened again. That happened six times. Six times people gave an exact amount of what was owed. Now, you can't, there's, nobody can do that. Nobody can do that. Because nobody knows that exact amount, right? Nobody did. So that was, that was awesome. Somebody says, Bitcoin? No, we don't accept Bitcoin. Leave that to you guys. I don't see anything wrong with Bitcoin or any of those things. I don't. I don't. That's just a. That's just another tool in the world. Here, here's the deal with money, though, guys. Here it is, right? You never want to get in a position where you're praying to the money to come to you. If you do that, the Lord's not going to let you have it. Some of you are meant to have lots of money. The problem is. It keeps changing you. You're not the same when you have money versus when you don't have money. When you can be the same person with or without money, God will not withhold it from you. When people get money, sometimes they know everything, don't they? Then when they go broke, they say, well, I don't know anything. Well, it's not the truth. Some people used to really think that if they had no money, God was not blessing them. That's not true. It's not true. Anyway, when money no longer moves you, when it's only a tool, you'll have it. You will. And again, some of you are meant to have quite a bit. Quite a bit. So you have to work on that. 
right? Because there will come a time when people will need you. They will. They're going to need you. And your resources are going to be an answer for children, for other folks, right? Be wise. That means don't be foolish in giving your money. Always be instructed. Be instructed. Understand your own compassion level. Someone said, did the number that was going to be put on the site, put on, I'm sorry, type that again, uh, the number on the site. Yeah, we're still going to get that number on the site because we need to start having our conversations and lots of uh, meetings. How about that? Well, well, not really meetings, but to talk about some of the publications that are going out. And yes, all your names will go on it if, you, if that's okay. All of your names will go on there. Somebody says, especially knowing that Michael does not want to ask for money. No, I do not. I don't want to. Again, if the Lord gives you a calling, you are that calling, right? And Satan is slick. He's very slick. Satan will, li listen, because see, I said this once before, and it's good that everybody knows this. With any organization where somebody starts out and they love the Lord, they're doing things for the Lord, here's how Satan works. He will send people to that ministry. <clears throat> Those people will give and build it up, right? They'll build it up. Once it's built up to a certain level, the people are coming in, God's word is flowing and moving, and people are getting blessed. That's when he strikes. Satan does not strike in the beginning. He strikes when you're about to have a breakthrough, when other people are being affected. They're about to have a breakthrough. That's when he strikes, and he will impress on one of those people who give a lot. They'll come up and say, well, you know, I don't really agree with this or with that. So the first thing they attempt to do is alter the word of God. And you find a lot of pastors, what choice do they have? Because if you build up like that, you're talking about faith. How is it going to look if your donors back off and then the church has to close down? That doesn't look like a blessing, does it? And we still, you know, people are still human. A lot of people can't. They can't really take that themselves because it does not feel like a blessing to them either, right? So he builds them up, and then when they get to a certain point, he'll take his high-dollar givers, and they'll give a message to the pastor to insinuate they're not going to support this and not, if they don't change this, and they got to change this. And to keep the money flowing, right? Pastors start changing things, and sometimes it gets out of control. And what I'm telling you that is nobody starts out saying, ooh, I want to be a pastor and rip everybody off. That's not how it begins. Satan gets to that pastor because of the people. If people would protect that pastor through prayer, by way of their love, nothing would get to that pastor. See, because there's a simple rule. If you go to a restaurant and you really like that food, right? You don't want that restaurant to close down because that's where you eat dinner every night, right? So take care of the restaurant. That's as simple as that. If you take care of that restaurant, right, that restaurant's going to produce more and more good food. If you don't take care of the restaurant, the food's going to get worse and worse. Then it will go away or turn into GMO food or something like that, right? Just take care of the restaurant. So do that to your local churches, local assemblies, wherever you find yourself being. Do that. Do that out of the truth. Do it by faith. Nobody should ever have to be prompted. Right? And it, it, you know what? I'll share this with you. It does not get to me if anybody treats me that way. It gets to me when I see other pastors go through that. It does. It gets, it hurts. It really does hurt because I know, I know that people can make such a difference. I know they could. No pastor, no pastor should ever have to ask in truth. If everybody operated by the Spirit, no pastor should ever have to ask. We shouldn't. Anyway, we're going to cover... Revelation, guys. And we're going to, let, let, let me 
Let me get the groundwork started because we're going to cover something controversial now. Some of you guys just popped in. I'm going to know something. How many of you guys think that Revelation is not in order? Come on, it's got to be somebody. Don't feel ashamed. I need someone that thinks that Revelation is not in order. I need somebody here tonight just like that. Who is it? It's got to be somebody. Somebody's got to be here that thinks that Revelation is kind of out of order. Not quite in order. Here's why. Here's why. I've heard that before a few times. I want to know why. I don't want to argue. I don't want to do any of those things. I just want to know why so that we can learn something tonight, right? Because I'm going to show something tonight that may, in part, be, be uh, one, of the, one of the issues with that. Something I've noticed over time that's been joined together. Right? It's been something has been drawn together and it shouldn't have been joined together. But it's so easy to join together because it sounds exactly alike. Right? And so that may throw everything off. But we'll we'll get to that. If you happen to be here and you, you think that certain things are not quite in sequential order in Revelation, hey, just simply let me know. You are valued, right? You are. Your your input is valued. So speak up tonight. If you think it's not in sequential order, that means one, one, one event after the other. Okay? One event after the other. Again, what do I believe? I believe the Word of God. Do I believe everything is in order? I just believe the Word of God. I just want to hear that point of view. I do. And I want to know why that will come up. That's all. I want to know why that will come up. That's it. That's all. Okay, guys, when I come back from this break, we're jumping right into it. We're going to jump right into it. Okay. Kennedy07. You're talking about the phone number, right? Is that what you're talking about? The phone number? The COT phone number? Correct? I'm waiting. It's a lag. It's a delay. I'll find out when I get back. Kennedy, when I come back, just give me a yes or no. And, uh, I think it's about the uh, COT phone number. If it is, if it is, we're going forward with that, with the phone number. Because, again, we have to have one of the phone numbers can house, like, multiple phone calls, multiple calls, so that all of us can be on the phone at the same time getting some things done. It's not the FaceTime thing. These are phone calls. So if somebody calls in, there's not a lot of, there's no technical thing to do. You just here. That's all you do is here. Uh, so we can get some things lined out that way, you know, kind of like a spot meeting, if you would, so that we can go and, and uh, do what we have to do, right? Then from there, we can move on to share documents and everything else. By the way, we have shared documents software in COT in the website. That is, is you guys can't use it yet because we haven't had a need for that. The admins will start using it almost right away, but everybody else will come. And that's our software. It's not Microsoft. It's not, uh, you know, Oracle, somebody like that. No, that's ours. It's homegrown, right? Homegrown. And again, I do that because uh, I, I can just see these software companies pulling the rug out from under any organization that would elevate Christ. I can see that coming. I've already uh, saw their EULAs and some of the some of the ones that are proposed are 2024, and they do not look good. There's so many things you cannot do, uh, and they have gotten quite religious because they say it's the core of most of the violence in the world. Some movement has started. They don't want Christianity or anyone who would ever say that there's only one way to heaven. They don't want those folks uh, putting those statements in their in their software. They don't. So anyway, when I come back, we're going into Revelation. We'll be in Revelation 16, everybody. Revelation 16. Okay, tonight, that's going to be very interesting. But I'll be right back with you guys in about two, three minutes. Let me get this charger ready. Because I did not charge this headset uh, last night when I went off the air. And uh, I've been up ever since. I'm standing up, too. I'm not going to sit down. If I sit down, I might get uh, sleepy or something. So I can't. But I'll be back in just a few minutes right here at COT. Okay, everybody, I'm back again. 
Good of you to join us, Angela. Is your is a little little bud close to you? Or tucked away. I gotta be careful if she's listening. Little bitty one. Okay, everybody, you guys ready? Revelation 16. Here we go. And wait a minute. I have to, you know what I did? That's okay. I got it going now. All right, it's going again. Revelation 16, we just read last night. Uh, the last one we read was concerning the sun, right? So here it is, Revelation 16, 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed God, the God of heaven, because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Let me ask you guys something. What type of person would it be to go through something and blame it on the living God and hate the living God for it? Uh-oh, let me, let me get ready because this is going to hit close to home. Please. Hope you guys are my, you know, good friends after we get done tonight. <laughs> I hope so. Maybe not, but I hope so. These people, when the kingdom of the beast, their paradise, their nations, when it was thrust into darkness, when it was sent right into darkness, when everything just went upside down, when it began to fail and everything went wrong, right? They did something. They blasphemed God, the God of heaven, the real God. It didn't say the, some made-up God. Nope, it said the God of heaven. They blasphemed him. Blasphemed God. You know how when we go through something, everybody, and it's real rough, we think it's rough, and all of a sudden, we say that word, why? Huh? We say, why? Lord, why am I going through this? Why am I going through this? You all know what I'm talking about? In this case, they blasphemed God. And you know what? When you blaspheme God, when you dishonor God, when you disrespect God, you don't always have to say something. Your feelings mean a lot. They do. I want you guys to listen to me. Because we cannot be anything like these people left. That's why they're left. Because of how they are. When things go wrong, they dishonored God. They blasphemed God when things went wrong because essentially so far that's exactly what happened. Do you know how close we get to that? Do you guys know what we do? Do we love Christ? Yes. But we all know when the hammer falls, we don't feel too good about things around us, do we? See, I don't know about you. I don't want to be anything like these people. I want to be authentic, right? I don't want to be one of those when everything goes wrong. All of a sudden, i got a problem with the living God because that's exactly how these people are. When their kingdom was thrust into darkness, they blasphemed God, the God of heaven, because of their pains and of their sores, because of their own discomfort, they dishonored God. Isn't that how it begins? Why, Lord, why, why? Because you know what? I've never, never saw anybody resolve anything with that. That's a challenge. When you say why, God, what you're essentially saying is, Lord, I do not agree with what you're doing. Who are we? If my cell phone, if I'm going to make a call with my cell phone, and it said, I do not agree with this number you're calling, I would take that cell phone and stop on it. Go get another. 
I say this phone is defective. I don't want it. It's good for enough. Right? This is what we can't be. We can't be those people because now you see these are the citizens of the kingdom of the beast, which essentially is a citizen of the world who is loyal to the kingdoms of this world. Hmm? See that? When a child I'll tell you guys something about children, because not everybody raises a child the same. If a child were in a car, and I were about to go somewhere, and I turned left, and that child said, why did you turn left? Let me explain something to you. There is a difference between an inquisitive why and a challenge why. Do you know that? All of us know this. All of us know this. If you guys cook dinner every day at 7 p.m. and your child comes up and says, why is dinner not done yet? And it's only 6.30. After a while, that's going to get to you. That's going to be a challenge. See, because the truth is the child wants what they want now. And so they ask that question, why, as a challenge. We know the difference because we do the exact same thing. We can cover it up all day, can't we? We know we know. Now, there's also an inquisitive why. And it never comes out like the challenge why. For example, if I'm doing something and all of a sudden, right, I'm, I'm doing some making something, for example, right, and all of a sudden, you know, I got ferric chloride all over the place and poof, it blows up in my face. And I turn a whole different color. Okay, in that case, I'm going to want to know why. I'm going to say, oh, Lord, why? Why did this happen to me? What do I need to change? What do I need to work on? You see the difference? When you ask the Lord why, and it is sincere, it does not come out, Lord, why are you doing this to me? No, what you're saying is, Lord, what, what do I need to do? What do I need to change? And you begin to reflect back in your life and you start making changes. You don't sit there and say, why is this happening to me? That means when we say, why is this happening to me and nothing else qualifies that why? Let's go ahead and face it. It's because we're upset. Let's go ahead and tell that truth. It's because we are upset. Did you guys know part of growth is to analyze who we really are versus we're going to be part of growth is to analyze how we interact with the living God and then realize what we're doing and make truthful adjustments. You know, that's part of growth. Growth is not staying the exact same way, justifying what we do. That's not growth. That's becoming stagnant. Growth is when we change is when we get better. We conform, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See that? That means you don't keep the same ways. You don't say, well, this is just the way I am and that's the way it's going to be. Don't say that. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You all see that? Do you see the difference most importantly? And do you see inside yourself that sometimes, yes, we do. We get upset when things happen. We do. We get upset when things happen, and we do say, why is this happening to me, Lord? In not an honorable way. But the truth is, we want the situation changed because we have a different qualifier. Here it is. Why is this happening to me, Lord? Didn't I do this, and didn't I do that, and didn't I do this right? Uh-oh. Isn't that how it happens? Huh? Huh? Thank you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus. I'm a cooked goose without him. Isn't that how we do, though? Isn't that how a child does? At first, they say, why? Why? Very disrespectful. As they grow, they reflect, and it changes. They stop saying, why? And they'll say, can you help me to understand why? 
this happened so I can avoid it. They're really smart. They'll go analyze everything they did. And they'll say, uh-uh, this, nope, not doing this again. Then let me go back and inspect everything. This is not the outcome I want. Let me go back and inspect everything. Because I messed up somewhere. And let me get that right. That's when you're mature. You'll automatically assume you messed up. When you're young, you assume somehow God is punishing you. Isn't that, isn't that about close to it? I don't know why God is punishing me. Right? Isn't that how we do? Because we don't want that correction. A child does not want that. What child runs up to the mom? Hey, mom, can you spank me? I've been looking forward to this spanking all month. Nobody does that. Nobody. you got to be out of your mind to do that. Right? So we don't want the correction. We want to do right. We want to have a good life. We want to smile. We want joy. And then kapoof, everything happens. And we don't get it. Do you see that difference now? These people of this kingdom, when their pain, when, when their situation backed up on them, can you imagine, right, they have the mark of the beast, they're buying and selling and nobody else can. They're witnessing Jerusalem and the Jews and this, that, and the other. They have witnessed that. They saw the two witnesses die in the street. Then they were scared to death when they went to their feet. When they left, they were, all oh, right, they're gone. Yes. But they're happy. The, this religious stuff is gone. Right? They're living it up having a party. Right? Playing all the new modern stuff. All the stuff they do. And then darkness comes. Plagues come. All of a sudden, the world is turned upside down. <laughs> remember, remember, they don't believe like you do. They don't. They believe they are their own gods, right? They believe in the power of the beast, right? And the beast, he worships the god of force. And the god of force is much like, I can't tell you that yet, but the god of force is much like something people study every single day on planet Earth. Something everybody talks about. Something they were trying to get you to trust. They had a message, a special message to the whole world. They used it for two years straight. You know what they said? You have to trust the science. That's what they said. You have to trust the science. That's what they kept saying. Did that bother anybody but me? What is science? The pursuit of truth. Right? The pursuit of truth. That's what science is. So science is knowing a bunch of what? A bunch of theorized things and facts. But science changes every day. So in essence, to worship the God of force. What is the God of force? That word in the Greek is what? It equates to something like forces. Not just force, but forces. Right? Forces like wind, like gravity, like, like you know, all these different things. That is actually to deduce your world and to know all the components of it and live your life accordingly. To say, oh, that's not supernatural. That's only that. That angel flying over there, oh, that's just misunderstood technology. That's what that is. So it's a redefining of things they can never grasp. They can never grasp it. By the way, what would cause someone to believe in something like that? Hmm? You ready? A spiritual absence. It's when you cannot, you cannot comprehend spiritual things. To say an angel flies by misunderstood technology means you have no idea. That by the divine will of themselves in accordance with obedience to the Father. God's creation obeys what they need at that moment. They don't need technology. They command creation in the stead of the living God because they're assigned a function. And they will carry that function out by the anointing of the creator who has command of all his creation. They don't understand that. Jesus walked on water. I wonder what they thought he had on his feet. I've heard people say, well, probably... It was at a time when the 
you know, the tide was lowest. And it was, he must have found a rock layer or something. He was walking on. They misunderstood that. It was in the middle of a storm and this, that, and the other. Right? I've heard all sorts of things. And these are people who worship the God of Force. That's what Madame Lavosky, she liked that, the God of Force. In fact, she is the one that made a declaration that all governments adopted. That the rule of Christ must end and make way, essentially, for the rule of force. See, she believed in the rule of force, too, which is what physics, science, right, measurements, all these different facts. Here's, here's the bad part. Is science composed of facts, yes or no? Somebody answer me. Is science the sum total of facts? No, let, let, let me change that. Everything you know about space, is it truth or theory? Somebody answer me. Is it truth or theory? Everything you know about space, is that truth or theory? You ready for this? It's 90% theory. Very little facts. And many of those facts are wrong because they change upon observation of other true things that do come about. So science, the facts in science do not equate to truth. They change. Isn't that something? They change. They change. A theory is an educated guess, the best guess somebody can give, based upon the most educated mind. Isn't that something? That's their stuff. Isn't that something? That's man's truth, man's way, man's stuff. So in essence, what I'm telling you is that it is self-created. And just in case you have not picked it up yet, man is wanting to become his own creator. Why do you think they spend trillions of dollars in all genetic fields? Because they want to take command of the flesh. Hmm? They have found some extraordinary things. If the spirit that drove them was not so dark, this would be a beautiful world. It really would be. Cure to cancer, no problem. They know all the mechanisms of cancer. They do. There are important people who have had cancer, and it was gone in a week. There are people who have had incurable cancer. I knew these people. You cannot cure bone marrow cancer. In a week, it's gone. They know the mechanisms. They know all the triggers to DNA just about to, to go ahead and solve many things. Right? They do. Listen, newsflash, that medicine is population control. Just in case you didn't know. They don't need to kill anybody. All of you are under a program. Their program. They will dictate when your expiration date comes up, they know exactly what it is. They do. They, they, this has already been in the works for a long time. But see, nobody talks that way because, I hate to say this, to keep a story interesting, you must always have something coming. You can't have something here. Nobody's going to buy anything that's already here. They need to buy the book on what's coming, right? That's much more exciting can't tell everybody that some program is underway and it's already been working and people believe it. They're, I don't want to believe that. That's boring. Where's the drama in that? Right? These people blasphemed God, the God of heaven, it says. So you know what it shows you? They know who has the real power, and they refuse to yield. They refuse to yield. So let's continue, right? And they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and sores. Listen, and repented not of their deeds. They did not to repent. Do you guys know what repenting is? Is it just something you say? No. You know, when you repent, when you really repent, you feel the anguish of your sin. You feel it. 
with your emotions. You feel it. And you want far away from it. You want it wiped out of all living memory. You do. You want as far away from that sin as you can get. And when you have repentance in you like that, you'll never go back to that thing. Thus, you have actually repented. To say I'm sorry is not repenting. To say I'm sorry is not to repent. To repent is when you turn away from. And you never do it again. You cannot be tempted into doing it again. You know how the Lord gets us to repent? Because we don't just automatically repent. You know that, right? You guys know the slew of supporting scriptures dealing with that subject? It is God Almighty who opens us up to see what we truly are doing. The damage it does. The depth of what we're doing. He gives us such vivid insight into our own doings that we get sick to the stomach at who we are having done it. And at that point, at that point, we turn away. At that point, we say no more. No. When you say no more, when you get to that point, you say no more. It doesn't matter how many times the devil brings that up. He cannot tempt you into doing it because you are effectively purged of that thing. Now, that brings up an interesting point. And it brings up something Satan does not want anybody to know. See, God is about deliverance, real deliverance, real deliverance. Not getting off something and going back to it two weeks later. No, that's not real deliverance. If I'm delivered from something and I go back to it, I wasn't delivered in the first place. Correct? I was not. I'm here to let you know God delivers for real. You don't follow some magic steps. Nope. You don't have a ceremony. Nope. All of it's authentic. And it begins with the living God. In fact, if God did not intervene, you would not repent. Why do I say that? Because you would never know. You would never know the stench of your own doings. If it does not stink, you won't get rid of it. You would never know how it hurt somebody else. You would never come to that conclusion that somebody needs you. And you were never by yourself. You'd never know any of those things. But when the Lord lets you know it, he opens up your mind, your heart, your soul, everything. And you see it, it seems like for the first time. And you would think the Lord would take it out of you. No, he does not. You know what you do? You forbid it from ever coming back into your life again. That's how disgusted you are. You forbid that thing from ever coming back. You push it out of yourselves and you say, Lord, I repent. I am not going back to that. And you do have an attitude behind it. That's when you start walking in a victory from it. That's when you're thankful. Because you know you delivered. That's when you think, see, when you have that change inside, when you have repented, you know that your Father will forgive you. But most importantly, you don't have that in you no more. It doesn't call your name. You don't think about it. It doesn't pop up again. Nobody can make you do it again. Nobody can tempt you. In the Bible, it says a man is drawn away and tempted of his own lust. It must be in you in order for you to be tempted. It's not in you anymore. It's gone. And when it's gone, guess what? It's not coming back. That's when the Lord seals the deal. He will seal the deal, and it's done, and you're free. He didn't do this one time. He does this multiple times throughout your life. Do you know the Lord never brings the subject of repentance for everything up at one time? Nope. Nope. You could be doing something weird one day. All of a sudden, the Lord will open up your eyes, your mind, your heart, your soul to something you're doing, and you'll fall. You'll say, no, Lord, no more of that. No. That's what you'll say. So step by step, you're being delivered. Step by step, you're being delivered. You guys are witnesses to this very thing.
That's repentance. These people, listen, they would not repent of their deeds. They wouldn't repent. They wouldn't turn away. They wouldn't purge them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being a living abomination in the earth? And your actions directly lead to the murder, the maiming, the mutilation, or whatever else of somebody else. And you, right, never get to the point where you push it away from you. But you continue to do it willingly. Can you imagine that? Huh? What type of person is that? I'm telling you right now, these people are not like you. These folks who are found in this time are not like you. They're nothing like you. Nothing like you. Even your rebellion is nothing like theirs. They repented not of their deeds. That's what type of people are left in the world. I don't know about you, right? I don't have anything in common with anybody who's like that. Right? All of it was valid. How will people be delivered? Well, let me explain this first. When your heart is heavy for the lost, that means you think they're lost. The only way you can think they're lost is to have been lost yourself and to understand what that's like. In order for you to understand what that's like, it means another scripture is true, right? See, we define something today in the chat room. I think we did it last night, too, that, that Christ came to save the ungodly. Do you know that? Not the godly, the ungodly. Which means we were all ungodly, or Christ does not apply to us. So he came to save the ungodly. And they immediately start going through a process called trials and tribulations. And if you start looking at trials and tribulations, they're very special. They work a very special thing. They give you insight. They do. We're also talking about people broken early and people broken later. But in all cases, that broken... That brokenness is purposed. Once you are broken, once you go through a trial, right? Once you do that, your compassion grows because you have an understanding of what it is to be broken and what components are in the middle of that brokenness. You do. Once you go through trials over and over again, it works patience. Yes. It'll increase your faith. Yes. Yes, it will, because you come out every single time. It's, it's a process. Something is happening. Ultimately, you can identify those who struggle just like you did. So you gain a heavy heart for those who are lost, because you don't want them lost, because you know what it is to be lost. You know the heaviness and the pain and the torment of being empty in this world. Who gave you that heavy heart? The same one who gave you eyes to recognize by way of compassion those who were lost in the first place. It was your Father in heaven through Christ. That was purposed. So when you have that heavy heart, then what do you do? What do you do? Remember, the question was, how is the Lord going to save us all? I'm telling you the process. It begins by way of compassion through recognition. That heaviness. Is your identification of somebody else. Now, in that moment, there are qualifications you have to have. You just can't run out there. So in your trials, you're going to go through some things that will educate you. They will. Life is going to be disappointing at, a, at quite a few turns so that you get educated. At the end of it all, right, you have the word of God. You have to be tricked to understand that tricks can be played. You have to be fooled to understand that people can fool you, right? Your heart's heavy. You want to go out there and do something for the loss. Ask. Messiah, ask. Just don't run out there. Ask. He already opened your eyes to it, so then ask. 
And when you ask, wait for him to send you. And when he sends you, he'll anoint you. And when he anoints you, his work will be done. That's how. He's doing it through us. He's doing it through your brokenness. He's doing it through your trials and tribulations. He is sending you to other folks who have gone through similar things that you did. He broke you in half so the contents would spill out, breaking generational curses that you would not repeat them again. Yes, he broke you. He broke some early so that you would be a useful vessel, that your heart would be heavy for the lost. That compassion is not automatic. If I saw a person walking in circles looking up at the air, I'm not going to feel heavy-hearted for that person. I'm going to say, what is wrong with that dude? But if I was ever in a bad spot in life, and I found myself walking in a circle, my chest hurting, stomach dropped, hopeless and everything else, I'm looking at the sky, right? And I saw somebody else doing the same thing. I'm going to say, oh, my goodness, there I am. I did that before. Let me go to that person. Lord, can I go to that person? See, because what? You, you identify somebody else who's gone through something you have. You have to be able to identify them. And the only way to identify them is to have gone through it. All your problems have been planned. Every last one. Nothing in your life is out of control. We sometimes think out of control. But nothing in your life is out of control. The Lord's doing what he's doing in you because... You have the can't help us in this one thing. You know what it is? You want to help somebody. You do. At the core of your heart, at the core of who you are, you want to help someone. God is qualifying that. Hey, sometimes it takes a lifetime to get one person qualified to go to one person. Do you know that? It's worth it. Nobody else can go to that person except those who are qualified. Everything in your life is highly purposed because you belong to the Lord. Did you notice also you were not lost in those processes? You were dipped in sin and everything else. Who cleaned you up? The Lord did, as he did others. Isn't that awesome? You are his body. Do you see it now? The real body. Do you see? You're the real body. Not We're not talking about sitting on your duffets. Right? No, 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 no. You're the real body. You're doing the work. And Christ is the head. He purposed everything. Nothing in your life is in vain. Even what you did messed up. Is being utilized for victory. Because there's a promise over your life. All of you who believe in Christ, there's a promise over your life. You know what that is? That through you, Christ will be glorified. That means you will be used. That's what it means. You're being educated, mature. You're growing up and everything else. But listen to me. That's you. These people here, they fully reject that. They fully reject it. When they go through something, they don't want it. They do not embrace Christ. They embrace themselves. They'll run to any deliverer so long as it's not Christ. They will always lift up their own. They will give men praises on a continuous basis. They will not praise the Lord. They're steeped in their own findings, facts, theories, and everything else. They will not yield to the living God. They're not like you. These are the true tares. They blaspheme God because they know about God. How? Because of you. Because they were around you. That's how. When the kingdom of the beast has an actual king, they're all going to go to it. Because the same way you have internal confirmation that Jesus is Lord, they have internal confirmation. 
that that beast, well, that's their guy. What did Jesus promise us? He said he would gather the tares together first, didn't he? Now you know how. In the great harvest, those who are alive will experience the tares being gathered first. First. Isn't that something? They're going to be all gathered together. How? Under the umbrella of the beast. What is the beast? Can't you see it? Open your eyes. They're running to it right now. They're praising it right now. In these days, you have to be careful. You have to open your eyes and be watchful. Don't become like them. Because they're running directly to the world, to each other. And they build each other up. They praise each other. And you, they don't want you anywhere close to them. They will scoff and mock everything about you. And that's only the first beast. Which is that set of nations. The second beast. That is the Antichrist. And what does the Bible say about the Antichrist when he comes forward? He comes from the land, L-A-N-D. He has two horns like a lamb, L-A-M-B, and spake like a dragon. He exercises all the power of the first beast that came before him. He calls us the earth and them that dwell therein. He said, hey, make an image of the first beast. And what they did, he gave life to the image of that beast. He performed miracles in front of them, calling fire down from heaven in view of all men. And they believed by means of those miracles he deceived everybody. But we also read last night that God would send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they all might be damned who loved not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What delusion is coming? The beast. Those who do not love the truth are going to take the mark of the beast. They will worship the men in these kingdoms. And you will see it. And for some of you, it's going to be heartbreaking. And the Bible says, worship the Lord your God only. And in him you are to trust. That's not what they're doing. Is it? No. It's not what they're doing. So you see something before you already. You may not have looked behind the curtain. But things are starting to become very clear. And instead of repenting, they blaspheme God. Let's continue. Since all of you have that. Here it is. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great rivers, Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up. And the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Did you guys hear that? Where have we read something like that before? Somebody? What does this sound like? And the sixth angel sounded. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay a third part of men. A lot of people think those overlap. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Doesn't sound like it? that was, I was just reading out of Revelation chapter 9, versus Revelation chapter 16. Sounds almost exactly alike, doesn't it? So let's read that again so you guys understand this. All I know of one, one person made a comment one time. They said, Revelation 16 overlaps Revelation 9 because of that event. Right? I'm going to clarify something real quick. Here we go. This is Revelation 16 again. The seven bowls of God's wrath. Hear me. Hear what I'm reading. 
and read with me. This is Revelation 16, 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great rivers Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So there was water, but it dried up. Listen, that the way, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, the same thing, it seems, is in Revelation 9. Let me read Revelation 9. And the sixth angel sounded. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet loose, the four angels, which are bound in the great rivers, Euphrates. The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. And the number of the army, the horsemen, were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. Sounds almost just like, doesn't it? Right? Here's the issue. Here's the issue. Okay, during the wrath, the waters were dried up to make a way for the kings of the east, not any angels. Just the kings of the east, the waters were dried up, right? To make a way for the kings of the east. Right? In fact, it says that the, 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 um, the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, it said prepared. It said that the way might be prepared. So the drying up of the Euphrates River, Right? The total, complete drying up of it. I mean, absolute drying up of it. Right? Is that happening now? And when it's drying up, it makes people think, hey, the wrath, this wrathful part is happening now. Take note of something. And what it said. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great rivers Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. It never said they came. It said prepared. I'm going to show you guys something. I'm going to show you something. Show you something. Lord, thank you. I'm going to show you. All right, let's continue. The other one says, the other one says in Revelation 16, though, right, that the sixth angel, which had the trumpet loose, the four angels, which are bound in the great river, Euphrates. So what's all this drying up business? Because right now we see the water is drying up. And, and anybody who would see the Euphrates rivers uh, drying up is going to look at Revelation 16 and say, wait a minute, why is that happening now? Can't you see it? Can't, nobody can see it? Oh, boy. You guys are going to need some coffee on this one. You need some coffee. You're going to need some coffee. You guys are going to need some coffee. Let me read the other one, though, because this is a dead giveaway. Now, remember, in Revelation 16, the river dries up that the way might be prepared, right? Let me continue. I mean, you, you guys sure you don't need a drink, pillow, cushion, something, helmet, seat belt? What is it? All right, here we go. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great rivers, Euphrates. That's Revelation 16, 12. Revelation 16, 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits. This country now, spirits. All right, let me read it right. It's coming. Here it comes. I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Uh oh, here it comes. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth the garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Again, listen, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven, 
from the throne saying it is done. Now, now listen, listen to me. Listen, we have the ways of the king of the east prepared. We read nothing about them ever coming. And now we hear a declaration, it is done. Now, follow me on this. And there were voices and thunder, thunders and lightnings. There was a great earthquake. And such as was not since man were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, and for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now listen to me. If I were to go back to the beginning... And read the first declaration, which is, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. That was the declaration. Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. Of course, it first goes out. And a noisome, grievous sore fell upon men which had the mark of the beast. So we know the mark of the beast is on people during this time. We also know that the kingdom of the beast was thrust into darkness. Right? We also know that the waters were made bitter. We also know that they were made turned to blood because they gave, you know, they took the blood of the prophets and so on and so forth. So all these plagues pour out. But what I want to get you to see is this. We get close to the end. We're talking about three unclean spirits. Three unclean spirits who have gone out unto the kings of the world, the kings of the earth and of the whole world. For one purpose, to do what? For, to do what? To gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That's not some overnight thing. If it came out of the mouth of the dragon, and the dragon was spoken of a long time ago in Revelation, the dragon was speaking by that. It was still unified by dark devil's tongue. The beast, it was in his mouth too. And what, what was the purpose of the three unclean spirits? To go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So you know they're lying, they're working miracles, they're doing everything they can do. To do what? To get people down to that place. Armageddon. How do they do this? Doctrines, philosophies, policies, governments. They're working already is what I'm telling you. They have been working. This is not overnight. They've been working. This is in the earth. This is happening right now. And people are believing. Remember last night we read God's John. Send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. These three unclean spirits are working what? These false miracles and everything else? What, what do these things do? It says, for they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That's been underway. It's been underway. The majestic things done in these kingdoms to win the hearts and minds of those over that they would serve them wholeheartedly and forget about the living God. What in this earth would compete with the living God? What in this earth would cause a person to worship it over the living God? It cannot be holy. It is not holy. And all this time, these kingdoms have been erected, built, and people have been totally following a doctrine. That is pulling them away from Jesus of Nazareth. You know, people are saying in the hearts, oh, surely, surely it can't be these kingdoms right now. Or, you think they're holy? Do they invite Christ openly? Didn't the Lord say you have to try the Spirit by the Spirit to see if it's of the Lord or not? Are they confessing? Do you hear them confessing? That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and died on the cross. You don't hear that from them. 
You've not heard that. Don't look at the money and say, in God we trust. That does not identify anybody with a man's face stuck on there. Don't be fooled. There are doctrines that go with these kingdoms. Jesus told us, we're not to live by any doctrine but the one he sanctified and gave us. But that's not what's happening. Because since we were born, we have been living in a world that is against Christianity, that is tearing down the rule of Christ, isn't it? This world is against his rule in every single way. And slowly but surely, you're seeing the fruit of the tree. So it's been on the way it's been happening. So wait a minute now. Maybe that's why we see that this vial prepares the way of the kings of the east. It only prepares the way of the kings of the east. And if this process, speaking of these three unclean spirits which have gone out to the kings of the earth, because you know what I know, when somebody becomes a president in any of these nations, there is a change. There's a change. Why? Let's analyze something. Every single last one of them. Did you watch closely? This is not... Listen, I don't cast stones at people. I don't do that. I want you guys to see what has happened. It doesn't matter how good a person is. If you're covered by... Why is it that a president has to do dirt before they ever get in office? Somebody has to explain that to me. Huh? Why? 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 And why does each and every one of them, when they get in office, they start saying, look what I did, I did, I did, I did. And why is it that they catch each and every president, I mean totally defaming their foes? They say the cruelest, rottenest things to their foes. And nobody cares. That's not holy. For a king? Are you kidding? A king, if God appointed any of you to sit above a nation and you believe in Christ, you'd be afraid of those statements. Do you know why? Because you have a relationship with Christ. And you're sitting there dictating the outcome of other people. You'd be afraid, cautious, aware. That's not what's happening, is it? Why is it almost like it's a game to them? How can anybody sit a king having knowledge of what's really wrong in this country and have a good time? How could anybody agree to perpetuate the filth? Why would anybody Make promises only God can keep. Something has been happening. Getting every type of person possible to follow the doctrine of these kingdoms. And what I'm telling you is that haven't you found it strange that when you're involved in politics, you're pulled away from the Lord. You become aggressive by nature. Don't you? You start looking at people as the enemy, not as your brother. Not as your fellow citizen, but as somebody who is your enemy. Why? Why? Listen, only Satan will give you an enemy in this time of grace and mercy. Do you know that? Satan is the one that will grant you a target. He'll have you make a target of any and everything. He'll do it every single time. Christ does not do that. He said, love your enemy. That's what Christ said. We can't get around that. He said, do good to those who despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. Didn't he? So then even the principles of operation of these kingdoms are opposite Christ's teachings in truth. Hmm?
This has been underway. Just like Daniel said it would be. Hmm? It's been underway. The way of the kings of the east is not some overnight thing either. To dry up the Euphrates River is not some overnight process. It is not. We're watching it happen. Uh-oh, but now we got to back up because if that's happening over the duration of time, how in the world are these seven bowls of God's wrath determined this way? That they would happen, that they would that they would go in and do what God appointed them to do. Surely he would have talked about that. Oh, he did. Oh, he most certainly did. That's why he said, come out of her, my people. Be not partakers of her sins, that you won't partake of her plagues. Oh, he did. That's why Jesus said, love not the world and the things therein. Oh, yes, he did. Back in the time of Christ, he begged us, didn't he? He begged us. He said to love this world is to have enmity with God. Think about it. To love the world is to have enmity with God. You know what that is? You know what enmity is? That's angry separation. That's just not separation. That's angry separation. Why would Jesus ever say that? During his time, because something was underway. Something has been happening. See, when you're born in the middle of it, you can't see it. If a child is born in the middle of the kingdom of the beast, they will never see the beast system. How can they see it? To them, it's going to be home. So who's going to be able to see it? Those who are blessed to see it. Those who are appointed to see it. Those who see it form. Those who see it take root. Right? Those who begin to see it for how Christ, they see it against the principles of Christ. Those things that speak the opposite of Christ are not of the living God. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. That's easily explained. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. You are your Word too. I don't hear you, I see your words. Therefore, I can address you, and you can address me. By your words, that's what I'm telling you. You can sit right beside someone and not know them. But when you start speaking, you can begin to hear them. Hmm? Hmm? My Lord, and that's only on the front side. No one's going to tell you about the morning prayers. No one is going to tell you what they put their hand on when they enter in to certain wings. No one will tell you the sacred floor in the Pentagon. Those are their sacred things. No one's going to explain to you the call of the priests. And we're not talking about God's priests. There's a corruption. Listen, how do you know it's a corruption? When somebody declares anything of the living God and that thing failed miserably more than once, and twice and three, I mean, make a declaration saying that God said something and God has declared something and that thing failed, there is a problem, period. That is man speaking out of his own spirit. Now, what would cause a man to do that? Whatever it is, it's not God's spirit. What would cause a man to say it's okay? For these new policies, and what is approved in these new policies, to be a pastor over anybody. What would cause a person to make an amendment and say there's a new church? A church that does not see 
the flesh at all. A church where there is no sin that can part you from the love of God. There's no sin that will keep you out of eternity and ultimately condemn the words of Jesus. Oh, you didn't know that was actually authorized? You didn't know that's an active policy right now? You didn't know that? You didn't know that these people are working by that policy, which defamed Christ on paper? Can I tell you this one thing? What you don't know will kill you. Because if you don't know something, you certainly felt it and ignored it. We all know that. We all know it. That's called discernment. No, we're... See, people in this time, God said they're going to be willingfully ignorant of the truth. That means they don't want to know the truth. They want their own paradigm to continue to go forward. See, when you're swept away so much that the consequences of the living God mean nothing, you're overtaken. You're overtaken, my friend. When you're not thinking about the consequences of God, you're certainly not thinking about the sincerity of Christ and you're overtaken you might want to look again at everything stop seeing through other people's eyes stop hearing through other people's ears and see for yourself and hear for yourself they make their declarations weekly it is impossible that any of you miss it And they've agreed to do it. They have agreed to do it. Do you hear me? Do you not know that some have agreed to no longer have their existing family? to keep their power to stay away from you do you know why they're terrified of going to work because you stink to them because you're a subject and they're not going to lose their seat they're going to do what's necessary to lord over you because they see themselves as they have been appointed and truth be told you don't want to know what they sound like outside of your hearing you wouldn't be able to function and it would cast down everything you hold close and dear it would void many things within you but one thing would happen you too would fight for the people and not for the dirt you would understand then but it's no joke These things in God's wrath. These things in God's wrath are progressive and waiting. Do you know that? They are progressive and waiting at the same time, which means things are in place. By God's timing, they will be, and no one will escape. The people that are left in this mess 
when they ultimately take effect, they fully chose their position. Before this time, though, before any of this takes effect, before the grievous sore is actually felt, right? Before the water is actually turned into this nasty stuff, before God gives the inhabitants of the earth blood to drink, for they are worthy. For they shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, the world did. Before that happens, many other things begin to happen in subtleties. Subtleties that work up to large-scale events. Now, before anybody ever says, well, no big major thing has happened, yes, it has. You weren't born in the time when it happened. This earth was black for 10 years. This is after Christ. People were on this earth and many died. We forget about those things. There were great wars that almost extinguished most life on the planet. This was before World War I and World War II, before the Civil Wars. We just discount those things. There were sicknesses. Grievous sores that popped up on everybody in various kingdoms and did take children, women, and men. People forget. It was a time when nobody had anything to eat. They began to dig in the ground to find food as everything else was exhausted or contaminated. We forget about those things. It was a time when People inside of one nation ran to another nation only to be enslaved. And when that story got back, many were so terrified that they risked everything to break away and start something brand new. There were times of massive genocide. Entire races fell. And cannot be found to this very day. We forget about those things. There was a time when animals began to devour mankind upon the earth. All this is after Christ. We forget about that. It is written there was a time when they would use swords and spears. That the cries of men could be heard around the earth. And yet, we see ruins, bones, manuscripts, stories, horror stories. And we pay no mind to it. We've had World War I and World War II, and we act like they never took place. People are still convinced but a horse is going to ride and take peace from the earth that has no peace. There's no peace on this earth. Do you not know that more people die today, each week, than they did in a very specific war? Maybe you didn't know that. Did you know that the violence is equal to, if not greater than, the death toll? Many faced in combat. Did you not know that molestation and rape numbers have skyrocketed so high? There's a gag order in speaking about it. But if you know police officers, you'll know the truth. People are different. Animalistic in their nature. Aggressive and heartless. Did you know our prison systems are overrunning with people who have no problem killing over and over again? I'm not talking about the friendly prisons. Nope. 
There are prisons you have never heard of, but you could hear of. There are prisons where prisoners cannot speak to one another. They can't speak at all. No contact one prisoner to another. And not one prisoner can see another, and they never will. And the prisoners do not care. They have a desire to kill. To maim, to do whatever. One day, the bars are going to fail. The magnetic locks are going to disengage. You know what one of my big concerns is? It's not the electronics being blown up by an EMP. No. It's a special event that will, in fact, interact with our atmosphere reversing magnetism, causing it to be chaotic. The lines of force will not align, and no magnet is going to work in that time. And in that moment, those doors are going to open up. And when they open up, those prisoners who are bloodthirsty, and in shape, they're going to get out. It's almost like God had America specifically to house the most deadliest folks on earth. And they're all here. Do you know that America has more prisoners than anybody on the face of the earth? Maybe you didn't know that. One day, those locks are going to fail. One day, the prison system is going to fail. One day, they're going to get out. Do you know that an earthquake can free those prisoners? Any number of things can happen, but I know for a fact the locks are going to be no good. Those locks are going to be demagnetized. In the absence of electricity or corrective lines of force, those doors will never shut again. They will get out. It seems like every foul spirit that ever was is being housed in these jail systems. And they're overrun. Those doors will open one day. And those people who harden their hearts against God's grace and mercy They will become, many of them will become victims. There will be diseases, new ones that you're not to partake of. This world is not going to be anything like you see right now. Wardens of jails have an understanding which is why they have a problem with the death penalty. Do you guys know why? When you kill a person who is worthy of the death penalty, you do nothing but free the spirit. And they know that no more than five days after a person dies by the death penalty, that same crime is replicated somewhere else. It has never failed. You know they knew about that? And they prayed about the procedures of the death penalty in many states for that very reason. Because they saw the pattern. Every time somebody would have some heinous crime, that person gets caught, locked up as soon as that person died. It wasn't more than five days. And it was replicated somewhere else. Every single time. Every single time. And that's just one issue. You know what I'm telling you? Doesn't matter what country you live in. That doesn't matter. Things are set up right now. Matter if God was not merciful and gracious and loving toward you, it would be hell on earth right now. Do you guys know about the loose generals? What's been happening lately? Yet again, out of control people in charge were trying to obtain codes 
they shouldn't have had. Procedures they shouldn't have had. Do you know that's happening more and more now? Breaches internally within intelligence with very sensitive weapons. You guys do remember that public story of those two. One was a colonel and the other guy. We tried to get the access codes to nuclear launch systems. You guys do remember that, right? You do remember they were waiting on an order from someone to fire those missiles, not at the enemy. No. But another protocol. You know, those things never stopped. We are dangling on a thread, is what I'm telling you. It is nothing but God's grace and mercy that we're able to breathe every single day. Never forget that. That every day is truly a gift. Things should have gone wrong already. But the Lord is holding it back. But he won't do that for long. Things will begin to happen. They will. You will see those signs of trouble. Greater and greater potential. It's going to scare some folks. Have an understanding of it now. All that's in Revelation. All those things God said would take place. are going to take place. They have been taking place. They will escalate. We were talking about Revelation being in order. Can't you see something about Revelation? The Lord is showing us what he has prepared and what he will execute. Things are prepared and ready. It's almost like there's a full fulfillment on all those preparations. And we're given what to look for. And we see it happening right before our eyes. But all this is not meant for you. That's why it's called God's wrath. You're not appointed to his wrath. So when he decides, this time, it will be upon the people of the beast. The tares are going to be gathered together. They're going to be taken first. Because they will come out from among you to join themselves with the systems of this world. In these dark kingdoms that do not belong to our Lord. And so then you hear in Revelation 16. What did we hear? Revelation 16, 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven. From the throne saying, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. There was a great earthquake. Listen. There was a great earthquake after he said this. Such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake. And so great, so great, and the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Did you see that? Did you see that sequence? Listen, when Babylon came into the remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Remember, he made that declaration. It says, in every island fled away. And no mountains were found. No mountains were found. Every island. You know, that's a global, that's an event that nothing recovers from. And there fell upon man great hail out of heaven. So at the same time, that all the mountains fall, the great earthquake hit that has never been experienced on this planet ever. At the same time, that's when the great hail comes. That's when the great hail comes. Can you imagine the earth shaking? All the cities of the earth fall, everything falling. And that's when the great hail comes. Every stone about the weight of a talent and men blaspheme God because of the plague of hail. Because that plague thereof was exceeding great.
God's wrath is finite. You're not appointed to his wrath. Jesus said that. You're not appointed to his wrath. That's why all of us are afforded the opportunity now, but make no mistake, you're going to have a prelude to these de declarative things. You're going to have a foreshadowing. Now, this is not something written. This is something you see over and over and over and over again. When God declares something, there's always a foreshadowing. And there's always someone who's preparing for it. Every single time God's people prepare for it, there's something put in God's people, a mechanism that tells them to prepare for it. They don't even know why they're preparing for it, but they start to prepare for it every single time. That's probably why they don't want anybody reading the book of Enoch. Not because of any doctrine, no. Not because of anything else, but what God did to the people he's doing to them now. Before the flood, people had dreams of trees upside down in the air. And it was dark and they couldn't understand what they were saying. It was as if everybody began to have dreams of floods. And do you know what you guys have had dreams of? Fires in the sky. Men in chaos. Water consuming places. War. You've had dreams of the very things declared to take place in these times. You also have a caution in your spirit. See, a lot of you would like to just say, well, I just want things to be normal, but you can't. You can't do it. That's why you wake up looking. You're looking, actively looking to see, oh, is this the day? You don't even know what you're looking for. But you'll never stop looking. The Lord put that in you. You're looking. Every day you're looking. How many have tried to not look? How many? Right? Maybe you go three, four, five days, you didn't look, and all of a sudden you hear somebody talking about something, and that's it. You cannot help but to, you got to turn it up. you got to go to it. you got to see what there. You just heard something that was similar to what you're looking for. You know what is said, but of the saints a time would come when men would look for what they know not. In other words, you would have something you were looking for that you're dedicated to find, but you don't know what it is. That's the time you're living in right now. You can't even let it go. And as we said before, each and every one of you is born with revelation inside of you. It's part of you. And if you ever try to be somebody else outside of prophecy, outside of revelation, you feel like your life is dead, like everything is pointless. Your joy is not within the earth continuing. And be, being happy-go-lucky stuff, that's not what it is. No. Do you guys know what happened between 2012 and now? You don't have to admit this. In 2012, when you guys heard of all the destruction, all the Mayan stuff, right? Maybe openly you were saying, I said Mayan, so I'm going to believe in that. But in private, you know what you were doing? I hope this, I, I, Lord, is this it? Can this be it? Please let this be it. <laughs> is that what was happening? Now, you didn't want to tell anybody because you're not one of them Mayan people out there, right? See, that Mayan stuff is, uh, some of you didn't even want to make that comment about the Mayans because inwardly you were hoping it was going to come true. Listen to me. And when it didn't come true, don't try to tell me because I felt the disappointment in too many different, in fact, it seemed like every ministry changed. Every single last one changed. It seemed like nobody wanted to talk about prophecy. Every time they tried to talk about prophecy, it's like their tongue got stuck up in their mouth, and they changed the subject. And it took at least, at least six months before people began to talk about prophecy again. 
You remember that? Nobody wanted to hear anybody's mouth about when Jesus was returning. No setting dates. Everybody was sick to death of dates. Do you know why they were sick? Because they were disappointed. You were disappointed. Because some of those events looked like they were coming, didn't they? And you were like, oh boy, could this be it? But the Lord said no. He said no. Do you know why he said no? Right? Something took the air out of a lot of people back then. He said no. Now you're so cautious. You're like statues, right? You want to believe, but there's something in you. that says, don't you do it. Don't you be fooled, right? Don't you be fooled. You want the Lord to come back now. But if somebody said, the Lord's coming back in two weeks, you say, oh, there we go. You want qualifications. Was there anything wrong with your optimism back then? Nope. It was only misguided. Let me tell you how. You guys were excited about things happening. But you were missing something. You were excited and you were really hoping something like that would happen, but something was missing. You know what that was? Your compassion for others. You forgot that the rocks would fall on their heads. Some people were even cold in their statements. Very cold Christians were at that time. I remember hearing them. They were cold-hearted. And if you weren't on the right side, then you were the devil's child. And people were just like that. No compassion. And it's almost like the Lord said, okay, I'm going to teach my children a big lesson. After the great disappointment, life was altered a bit. Your expectations rearranged. And the Lord began to teach you about compassion. Many of you went through something during that time. Don't you remember? There were millions of people who lost their livelihood because they gave it away or sold it or something like that. They threw caution to the wind. They did not take care of responsibilities, and things went right upside down. But ever since that time, the Lord has been opening up your heart to others. You want the Lord to come, yes, but more importantly, you want people to be ready for the Lord's coming. Back then, you didn't care if they were ready or not. You said, come on, Lord, come on with it. They're not ready. That's their fault, not mine. And you were joining yourselves with those who seemed to be ready. And your compassion meter was low for those who were not ready. Hmm? It's not like that anymore. You've slowed down. Your compassion has kicked in. So has maturity. You have an expectation, but you're never too quick to exercise that expectation. You're always brought back to the others who may not make it. And so when something truly comes, when something really comes, your compassion level is going to go through the roof. You know what happens when your compassion is through the roof? You're not going to be excited like you were last time about the Lord's coming. And you didn't care who got hurt along the way. You know what's going to happen? You're going to stand up in the middle of chaos itself. When your compassion level is high, that's when you have no fear. That's when you stand up in the middle of death itself and you go and help someone. That's when you do it. And the only thing that can actually bring that about is the situation itself. You will never know your capabilities until the crucible is here. The Lord raised you since that time. You are seasoned. Many of us got corrections, didn't we? Many of us. Sometimes you guys see the young come in and they're excited about the end. They want it to happen now. And you see them get excited. But then you're thinking in your mind, slow down, slow down. The Lord's coming. Let's make sure everybody is ready. The Lord's work is awesome. The Lord's work in you is, in, is amazing. It's even amazing I was able to witness that. The growth. 
the change. It is an amazing thing. Somebody is that Angela has a question. Let's see, let me back up. What was it? Somebody, because I totally missed it. Type it again, Angela. See a question. Go ahead and type it again. I, I totally missed it. What time is it? 9.10. I'm long-winded tonight. I, I do apologize, everybody. Well, at least the battery lasts. Lasted. What is the uh, question, guys? Oh, Lord, she lost her question. She said, Robbie, you have my question. Oh, uh oh, it must be getting late. It's getting late. It's getting late, everybody. When you ask a question, right? Then you point at somebody else and say, wait a minute, you had my question. Where is it at? Man, it's time to go to bed, right? Don't you guys think? Bedtime. <laughs> Folks, be ready, though. Now, listen, I'm going to give you guys a, a preview of an upcoming conversation so that you're warned, okay? While you guys are getting that question so that you're warned. It will involve the bottomless pit. It'll involve aspects of what's being held back. Not something coming. No. What's being held back. It's not going to be made up. Now, I'm going to speak to you from the heart, just so you know. And, and uh, it doesn't really matter to me if you think I'm, you know, my bowling ball doesn't go all the way down the lane, or my bread isn't baked, right? My elevator is not going all the way up. That doesn't matter. It matters that uh, you have an awareness. That's what matters. Was there a shift in the spirit we deal with after Cain murdered Abel? Well, Cain operated by a spirit that was already in the earth. Think about that. Think about that. So that spirit was already in there. In fact, with Adam and Eve, Satan was already here. And Cain dealt with that same spirit. Right? But from all the reading, you can extract something with that. Right? Satan was the first one. Everybody had to deal with him. What did he do? He caused Eve to disobey the living God. When they both disobeyed the living God, right? When they did that, they were frightened and ashamed. Now, that means they had emotions in the negative realm. They didn't speak about emotions in the negative realm before that. Everything humanity does, you give birth to something. You do. Now, all you guys are mature, so I'm going to say it this way. It's like losing your virginity. You're one way before it and one way after it. And there's no way to get back. Now, I know that many people have many different circumstances, but the process is still the same. You're one way before it, one way after it. Sin is the same way. So then everything we do, right, when it's done with that evil intent, it gives birth to something everybody has to deal with. We're all humanity. Correct? So then whatever humanity releases, humanity is going to have to deal with. And if you, if you look in the Word of God, for every act you see committed, everybody ended up dealing with that act, that same influence, until the time of Moses, when sacrifices were given, and the influences could be put down a bit. But you're still dealing with that spiritual influence. The fallen angels, when they made it with women, they gave birth to giants, right? But when the giants died, 
And when those men of renown died, their spirits remained in the earth, and they were known as evil spirits. Who gave birth to those spirits? Mankind did. Mankind did. Whenever we fornicate with evil, we give birth to evil. That's why of the seven churches, when I talked about Jezebel, it said something. What did God say? I gave her space to repent. And because she didn't repent and continues to seduce my servants, because that's what she does, God said he would kill her children. What children? How can Jezebel have children? Spiritual children. A doctrine. You take one of God's vessels, mingle that with darkness, you're going to have a child. And people are going to have to deal with that child. Do you see it? Same thing happens spiritually. If you're in a house, and your house is perfect, and the atmosphere is perfect, right? And you get somebody in your house this evil and dark, right? The moment you step out of obedience and grace and mercy, and you call yourself throwing a punch, you're doing what humans do. You have to deal with the negativity or the residue of that spirit, even the spirit itself. Whenever you act in righteousness, when negative spirits are around, you purge them. Whenever you act in flesh, when those spirits are around, you have to then deal with that spirit in your house. Because here it is, when you interact with the spirit, your own way, my way of flesh, you allow that spirit to operate in your domain. Because you walked out of obedience. What did the Lord say about those who operate in disobedience? He said those who are disobedient are what? They're under who? The prince of the power of the air. Beelzebub, Lucifer, right? That's how that happens. Michael was murder intertwined in family before Cain and Abel or only after? No, murder was part of Satan. Satan was a murderer from the beginning, right? So murder, so, so Satan got to Eve. Jesus told us that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. So murder was in him, and when Eve disobeyed, then Eve had to, Adam and Eve had to deal with the characteristics of that spirit, of Satan, which is what? He was a murderer. He was a liar, right? He's the author of confusion. He's a murderer. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. Why did he say that? Because he was talking about Cain and Abel. That's exactly what he was talking about. Cain and Abel. Why else would Jesus say that he was a murderer from the beginning? I remember in Genesis when he said, what he said to uh, uh, Eve, you shall not surely die, right? So in essence, he killed Eve, didn't he? Yes, he did. And he was a murderer from the beginning. So by him, murder is in the earth. He is the murderer. Anybody obedient to darkness will also murder. All those acts are tied to the spirit of origin. Well, she says, Angela says, but someone had to be an open vessel for murder to dwell. An open vessel or for murder to dwell is not to obey God. Here's how easy it is. In disobedience, anything can use you. Anything that has ever operated in humanity can use you in disobedience. So what happened to Cain? Cain saw his brother's offering being accepted, but not really his. So Cain sought in his mind that if he would kill his brother, God would accept his offering because there's no competition. You see that? You see how that works? Who put that thought in his head? That's a conceptual idea for murder itself. To utilize murder. Murder wants to murder. It wants to act. Cain entertained it when he was disobedient. When he sought to have his offering accepted over Abel's. That's what happened. That's where it started. That's where he stepped into disobedience. He coveted. Is what he did. 
He wanted Abel's offering to be his offering. He wanted to be above Abel, just like Satan wanted to be above the living God. Can you see that? Sin was already released in humanity. So anybody who stepped into disobedient activity would be utilized by that sin. See how that works? Huh? That's right. It's jealousy. That's why we were told not to covet our neighbor's stuff, nor his wife or anything else. That's why we were told that. That's why we can't compare ourselves to anybody else. Because that's exactly what will happen. You are not to have a desire for anybody's anything to your left or to your right, before you or behind you. Because if you have a desire for somebody else's stuff, what is that? It's covetousness. And what is a cousin to covetousness? Jealousy. If you don't get it, all the while you don't have it, you're jealous of it. Do you see that? When you're coveting something and you don't have it, you're jealous of it the entire time. Do you guys see that? Now you know how that family line works. Okay, folks. This has been an awesome night. It really has. I'm going to say thank you to everybody out there for joining me tonight. And you stayed. That's awesome. I thought some of you guys would have left. Anyway, hey, I love the Lord's correction. I do. I love his correction. I love the growth. Right? You guys are a testament to so many things about these godly values. It is amazing. Don't think that, uh, don't think that you're getting most of anything out of this. I am. Because they get to witness the change, right? I get to witness the scriptures taking effect in people's lives. It is awesome. It is. Remember something, though. Jesus will see you through all the way. He will. He will. So follow him. Please follow him as best you can. Hmm? Follow him. All right, folks. This is the end of of the broadcast. It it did kind of go fast, didn't it? It did. It did. God bless each and every one of you. And the little pink lady came in today. God bless you, little pink lady. You the little tiny little pink bud piece is not with you, is it? The little tiny little flower guys? She's got a little that's a feisty one. It's got little stickers and thorns on it if you're not careful. No. Nah. Angela has beautiful kids. Good kids. Very good kids. <laughs> Very good kids. Everybody, God bless and keep all of you. I'll see you guys next time right here at COT. God bless. <laughs>